my name is Tiff McNaughton, if we haven't had a chance to meet. And uh, of course, there's fellowship after the service. Stay for, stay for more coffee and tea and the chance to just say hello. I was asked this morning if it's okay to bring coffee into the sanctuary, and the answer is definitely yes. <laughs> so please know, if you arrive early and you want to have your coffee and sort of settle in before the service, you can bring your cup all the way in here. We have this fancy floor that is like so very washable. <laughs> uh, we're not worried uh, about about that kind of like spilling and staining, and we're just uh, yeah, come on in, and be comfortable. Um, I think that's the only thing I had to say, and I'm going to pass you over to Linda Braid, our reader for this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Lovely smiling faces out there. Good to see everybody. Thanks for being with us today. I have two very quick announcements. First one, ukulele. This Wednesday, 12 o'clock here. Where? Our Beautis room. So please think about coming. Secondly, Saturday, we have a garage sale here, uh, hopefully mostly outside. The weather is supposed to be great, unlike one time that I participated when it snowed when I arrived. <laughs> but it looks like it's going to be a really nice day. So uh, the time is 9 to 12.30. Please come and please bring lots of money. Okay? Great. Okay. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. I'd like you to say with me the welcome and land acknowledgement. So here we go. As an affirming ministry, we boldly declare that we fully welcome and include the full participation of all people in the life and work of ministry as we journey together, regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, ethnicity, age, marital status, mental or physical ability, beliefs, cultural backgrounds, or economic circumstance. We are dedicated to being good stewards of God's world, working and living towards justice and wholeness for all God's people. And the land acknowledgement. This land on which we gather is the traditional land of the Sikhimical people. They have lived and thrived here for thousands of years. We give thanks for the land and its people, and we pray that in our worship and our daily lives, we may honor the tradition and respect that is held for this land. lighting our Christ candle for us. We light this candle each time we gather for worship in acknowledgement of the light of Christ that journeys in and through and with all beings living in love. Oh. I thought that just happened to me. I'm not special. It's coming. Thank you. <laughs>
And gathering words. From the beginning, all life has been connected. There is a holy thread that weaves our lives together. At times, this truth is hard for us to know, but there is a place where we find ourselves in each other. A place where every living being is valued. We come to it on occasion, in brief and fleeting moments. It is our home in the life of God, our place of origin and return. Let's go there together. Love has shown us the way. Let us pray. Beloved one, in times of uncertainty, you are the ground that steadies us. When nothing feels stable or secure, the knowledge of your abiding presence is our strength and our comfort. Remind us, O oh God, that we need not look out far for you. As close as our breath, our neighbor, and every creaturely thing, you reach for us. Thanks be to you. Amen. So, um, when you're a minister serving with the congregation, you have something called continuing education time. I used some of our continuing education time this week to go down to a conference called Resurrection. Uh, I, I stand corrected. They call themselves a party uh, rather than a conference, but it's kind of hard for me to submit a party to my Con Ed budget. So I'm getting the language a little mixed up. <laughs> um, the speakers and the guests explored the stories of the resurrection from a few different angles. Many of them were organizers in new church movements. Uh, and they were, they were speaking alongside established leadership roles in the United Church, like our general secretary and our moderator. And uh, all of these folks encouraged us to reflect on topics such as colonialism and decolonizing, and the sneaky creep of racism and microaggressions and the need for intercultural ways of being, and how rest and a slower pace and the space to simply be curious can help us address these things in ourselves and in our communities. These were lovely sessions to get to be a part of and much aligned with things that Brecken cares about and hopes to reflect on in our months and years to come. So you'll be hearing more about all of this sprinkled in our reflections and, uh, and definitely in our upcoming Stardust events as well, wherever it doesn't fit well with scripture as we go. Our General Secretary, Michael Blair, spoke about the most recent round of planning the church has been doing at the national level. Everyone from across Canada was, uh, was invited to conversations that were mostly via Zoom at the start of all of this. It was a few years ago. It was born out of listening and, and designating space for all of us to listen to one another. And they came up with three catchy titles for what we're up to as a church. Deep spirituality, bold discipleship, and daring justice. <laughs> Behind each of these, he acknowledged a foundation or central need for listening, for continued presence to one another and to voices beyond this little corner of the world that is the United Church of Canada. And, uh, and being willing to sit with potential discomfort that comes with waiting and learning instead of jumping in and doing what we already know how to do because we're the United Church and we do things. <laughs> we hear six little words and we think, oh, we, we know how to do that. Yeah, let's go. But the thing is, we're not being asked to do what we've always done. We can, but we're being encouraged to find new dimensions of these themes, deeper expressions of spirituality than we're used to practicing bolder and more intentional expressions of discipleship than we've been engaging, and daring justice requiring a great deal of humility and patience and reflection, which is challenging for a church that used to being, that's, that's used to sort of being out there and loud and proud and leading the way. Now all of this is swirling around for me in the most lovely way as we approach our scriptures this week. 
For the last few weeks, we've been hearing about moments when Jesus has appeared to the disciples after the resurrection. We take a few steps back this week in the book of John, and we hear Jesus saying farewell and anticipating the difficulties ahead and, and, and naming his own upcoming absence. He's speaking to people who do not yet understand the context and who don't have the cultural comfort or home base that many modern followers of Jesus have. As we prepare to hear these scriptures, I encourage you to imagine what it could be like to hear this before Christianity was established, before the resurrection was known to follow Jesus' death. Scripture today comes from Psalm 31 and John 14. Psalm 31, a psalm of David. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. And also from Psalm 31, 15 to 16. My times are in your hand, Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. John 14, 1 to 14, Jesus, the way to the Father. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may also be. As you know, the way to the place where I am going, sorry, and you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do not know him and have seen him. You do know him and you have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, Show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own. But the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also be the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. Let us receive what the Spirit is saying to the church, and let us say thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our 
passage from John today has some pieces in it that might sound familiar and catchy. I think especially of that line, I think it would might maybe be the most recognizable. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, statistically, um, a little under half the people who come to the United Church of Canada on a Sunday morning have been attending the United Church off and on to some measure since they were born. Not that, not that one is attending all that time, all those years, but that would be the tradition at, at, your, at your roots. Um, so whenever you move around to a new community, maybe you've connected with the United Church, or maybe it's been for different seasons of your life. For a tradition that's only existed for 98 years on paper, that's pretty special, really. If that's your story, hello. It's lovely to see you. <laughs> the United Church has increasingly become a place to come for those who have experienced hurt or disruption on other branches of the Christian family tree. They actually find when new people come who aren't, who aren't what we've just described, who are sort of raised in it, when new people come, they've often been somewhere else first. This is not, these aren't unchurched people. These are people who might describe themselves as malchurched rather than unchurched. People are, who are thinking, you know, hey, something doesn't sit right about this teaching that I've received and this experience that I've had, but I truly believe this whole thing doesn't need to be thrown out. There must be other ways of doing Christianity, living this experience. If that's your story, hello. <laughs> it's lovely to see you too. This is a two-way thing, of course, by the way. I meet a lot of people who say, oh, I was raised in the United Church, or I used to go to a United Church. And they tell me about their current church home or about how much fun it is to go skiing on Sunday morning <laughs> instead of going to church. <laughs> and I'm glad that they found what they're looking for at that time in their lives, and I wish them well, and I'm always in favor of a good ski day, and I'm pretty sure God is on the snow as much as God is anywhere, even though, yes, the practice of gathering for worship is special, and I'm glad that it has our time. One of the important things that the United Church offers, in the family tree of churches here in Canada anyway, is a belief in the inclusivity of Jesus, which is not to say no other churches have an inclusive stance, because we're not alone in that. But I mention this because our text today has often been used to reinforce the exclusivity of Jesus the singular saving being that is Jesus. And I don't usually like to set things up in this binary and go, oh, that's exclusive over there, and this is inclusive. But I'm getting to a bit of that today. We're going to examine this passage a little bit and dismantle the exclusivist and supremacist thinking that can creep into Christianity, even throughout the history of our own lovely United Church. Because as Fred Rogers used to say, if it's mentionable, it's manageable. If we don't talk about these things directly, they keep on creeping, and they influence our practice of discipleship and our understanding of the teachings of Jesus. Reverend Dr. Caroline Lewis will be one of our guides this morning. She notes this farewell of Jesus is anticipating and assuming the events that lie ahead of him. While he's speaking with the disciples in the words we've just heard, he's speaking indirectly, well, directly, but vaguely, about the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the ascension. This is all made possible by the incarnation of Jesus, and it all adds up to the conclusion of the incarnation, the end of the era where Jesus is this point of the Trinity that's taking flesh and living among us. Jesus is speaking to people who have just watched Judas leave them, and it's already been predicted that Peter would betray Jesus. They're sort of at the threshold of all the difficulties that are to come. The nervousness is already building. Thomas is looking for a literal map. Bless his heart, he wants to know exactly where Jesus is going. Philip, too, is asking, at least show us where God is, like, approximately. That's enough. We'll figure it out from there. <laughs> and times of uncertainty often make us want to be extra certain of what's going on. But of course, this isn't a situation with literal locations or certain knowledge. So Jesus dives into metaphor. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
And we're used to hearing that kind of absolute. It can sound absolute, can't it? And it is in that the I am statements are meant to be absolute, but they are meant to be absolutely expansive and open, signaling the ever-present nature of God and the wild movements of grace that Jesus is part of. At that time, there was not a way associated with Jesus in the literal sense. There was nothing for Thomas to put on the map. There was no Christianity. <laughs> I've said it recently, but Jesus wasn't a Christian. So he's not saying, you know, be super Christian here. <laughs> there were no churches. There was no association with this way. The way in this sentence serves to demonstrate how it's not possible for God or Jesus or any of what's been taught to be reduced to somewhere that can be found or something that can be attained, something that can be commodified, if you will. The way here is meant to console people who were distressed and confused and who were about to be grieving the fracturing of their tender new community and the loss of Jesus in their midst. He knew it was coming. He knew it wouldn't be pretty. So he was being expansive in his language so that whatever comes next might fit and might hold comfort. That's not what happened with this text over the years. Over the years, this I am statement has often become a tool for representatives of Christianity to determine what is not the way, the truth, and the life. The idea that no one gets to the Father except through me has worked its way into supremacist thinking. As Christianity became intertwined with governments and kingdoms that had the power to invade the lands of others, rather than vulnerable people who didn't have such power, Teachings like this told them, hey, you believe in Jesus, so you have the way, you have the truth. No one gets to the Father without you. So go ahead, you're doing them a favor. You're giving them access. You're doing the right thing. Ew, right? Now, Canadians are not accustomed to recognizing supremacy in our own midst. We are more comfortable pointing it out in the United States or in countries where we see people being harmed by laws that are not similar to our laws and by a lack of human rights. We don't have to look far, though. And we should keep looking far. Let's keep doing that. But let's look closely, too, to see the continuing influence of this kind of thinking. If we're willing to take a good hard look at life here and now, the way, my friends, becomes more clear. So, Christian supremacy was strong in the work of the Canadian government and churches in establishing residential schools. We've learned of the harms of this genocidal project of colonialism. It's not enough to say, well, we know that was wrong. It's important to recognize that supremacy puts on a new disguise for every generation. And if we spend all our time patting ourselves on the backs for being more fair and kind than people 200 years ago, that disguised supremacy will keep living among us. Christians and people influenced by Christian culture will continue to impress our values and expectations, our way and our truth, upon indigenous people, for only one example, without respecting the diverse views and wisdoms before them. And we won't notice what we're doing as a terrible thing, because we'll think we're not as terrible as those previous generations. We're doing the right thing. As we continue to work with the learnings offered in inclusivist thinking, and some of the wisdom that I, I haven't even had a chance to process from colleagues and mentors and friends at the conference this week, as we move from Easter into the season of Pentecost, we will have many more opportunities to reflect together on how we be the church, how we can carry on living in dialogue with spirits movements, and how listening for that which is just beyond our understanding remains so very crucial to our faith. It is both possible and necessary to move beyond the obvious and sneaky influences both of supremacist thinking and celebrate that where Jesus is, is the great I am. And we are called to so much more than thinking that we already
currently and forever have it right. We are not limited by the one and only way to God. We are invited to live beyond such restrictions and follow Jesus beyond our understanding. May the peace of Christ and the disturbance of the Holy Spirit be with us as we seek to follow Jesus in this time and place. Stand as we sing, will you come and follow me?
received in these past days, and part of how we celebrate is by sharing it on. Be with us, guide us in our sharing, not only here, but in the days to come. And we give thanks for all that is offered here, and all that we can choose to do in the expansive way of your love with all that is received. Amen. Amen. Let's share now in our prayers of acknowledgement and reconciliation, and this will be followed by, um, is it followed by the Lord's Prayer? I don't remember. I don't have it written in here. <laughs> I think it's not. No, I think that's during communion. Right, no. Is it Sunday? Are we sure? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Beloved community, let us pray. <laughs> God gathered here. We gather in the light of your love. We gather knowing that even when holding difficult topics as a community, we are loved. We gather knowing that we are free and supported in exploring this life that you bless our living. We acknowledge, O oh God, that there is so much we do not yet understand. We acknowledge we don't even understand the process of understanding. And we confess our entanglement with the practices of supremacy. We confess we are so entangled with it, we are uncomfortable even confessing it, and we don't even know where it is. We lament the ways we have been targets and victims of oppressive patterns, the ways that we have been pushed down, and we lament the ways that we have benefited from others being pushed down. We lament the ways we have ignored this thinking and assumed we are beyond it, that we have moved on, that life isn't so bad anymore. And we lament the wisdom, the way, and the truth that has been lost on us in the meantime. God, in your grace, there is a movement. There is a movement of expansive love. There is an invitation to see beyond where we have been and how we have been. God, in this there is hope, in this there is life, in this there is commitment to loving our neighbor as ourselves. And for this that we can be a part of, we give you thanks. In all that we have done, in all that we have left undone, God, when it's mentionable, it's manageable. We confess not because we don't believe we're already forgiven, we confess because it helps us process all that we are forgiven. And it helps us learn, and it helps us grow, and it helps us live into your way. For this, we give thanks. For the reconciliation we are invited to live into, O oh God, we give thanks. Amen. So we greeted one another on arriving today, and as we prepare for communion, let us greet one another again, newly aware of the peace of Christ flowing in each of us and the joy of sharing it with others. We are invited to share the peace by saying something like, peace be with you to those around you, and, uh, and when someone says that to you, if you're not familiar with this practice, you can say something like, and with your spirit, or, and also with you, or, I really like your scarf. That works too. It's okay. We're seeing each other in all our layers. Now, um, knowing in these days we all have varying, um, varying readiness to be near one another. So if you're a person who's not ready to be physically touched by someone else in your greeting, hold your hands over your heart. In this way, you can um, less literally and more metaphorically express your sharing. Um, and if you're ready for handshakes and hugs, uh, just make sure the person you're interacting with is too. <laughs>
from the challenges of discipleship. At the same time, you nurture hope within us that we might be Christ's love in the world. How thankful we are for your careful tending of our hearts. As we gather here, in the name of the triune God, we humbly ask that you would be the spirit of grace among us. Surround us with your presence and bring us into communion. Make the loaf and cup more than symbols of grace as we are joined as the body of Christ. As a practice of our faith, we share in the prayer Jesus taught to his disciples. Our Father, our Mother in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As we gather at this table, we're not recreating the Passover meal or even the Last Supper. Our communion is more than a memorial of ancient times. Just as God is the God of the living, for to God, what? Just as God is the God of the living, for to God all are alive. We gather here to be in the presence of our living God. It's not that we don't remember, for we recall how Jesus multiplied five loaves of bread so that over 5,000 hungry and tired people could be fed with leftovers and in abundance. And we recall a wedding in Cana where Jesus made six stone jars of water become a wine most excellent, shielding the new couple from the embarrassment of a party running dry. In his life, death, and resurrection, in his every teaching and miracle, Jesus made the fullness of his being available. When we come to this table, it is this generous flow of life that we rejoin. And so we recall that on the night of betrayal and desertion, Jesus took bread, broke it, and gave it to the disciples. He said, when you eat this bread, remember me. And in like manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to them. And he said, when you drink this cup, remember me. Life's greatest feast is before us. Beloved community, we remember here today, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. God, you transform. You transform all that is before you with mysterious grace. You illumine all that is before you with mysterious hope. You season all that is before you with mysterious love. These ordinary gifts of bread, juice, cracker, and grape bring nourishment beyond understanding. Amen. Now, um, our greeters will guide you in coming up to the front to receive the elements, and you can follow the person before you back around to your seat. I think we've got enough space here that uh, hopefully there's no collisions. <laughs>
not yet, please partake in your view. For the renewal we find in this simple meal, we give you thanks. For all the elements of creation that come together to create what sustains us, to create each of us, we give you thanks. Amen. <coughs> so, beloved community, go from here. Go knowing you are invited into a way of peace beyond our understanding. Go knowing you are blessed and you are blessing. You are loved and you are loving. Amen. So this next song is what we call a round. It doesn't mean that it's round in shape. It just means that we sing different words at the same time once we know what the words are. So we're going to sing it twice through. Okay? Clear as mud? Yeah. <laughs> now, 